Well, hello and welcome everybody yet again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, this week we have Gareth Rushgrove from Puppet with us. Um, I'm really pleased to have him, not just because he's a Puppet expert, but because he's really one, one of the wonderfully opinionated, well-researched persons um, that I always love to hear speak. And so um, we're really lucky to have him here, and especially straight off DockerCon. Um, so please feel free to pick his brain in the Q&A. Um, we're going to let Gareth do his presentation first, do a couple of little demos. You can ask questions in the chat, um, and then we'll leave time at the end for Q&A, and we'll open it up for a conversation there. Um, so without further ado, Gareth, I'm going to let you get started, and um, we will um, learn all about Puppet and OpenShift and how to use it with the new Kubernetes architecture. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Um, as Dan just said, I'm going to do a quick introduction uh, to so, some Puppet and OpenShift bits and pieces. Um, I'll run through a few slides and then just get into some demos and then any questions and answers people want to do. So quick introduction, I'm uh, Gareth Rushgrove. I'm one of the senior software engineers at Puppet. Um, so I mainly work on uh, building out Puppet, um, doing a lot of integration with uh, tools like OpenShift and Kubernetes. Um, and I'm Gareth R pretty much everywhere on the internet. So uh, I'm sort of assuming people are familiar with Puppet, so I'm not going to go into a lot of sort of the details. Um, but Puppet's a configuration management tool. It's a DSL-based language with a whole suite of tools for managing all sorts of infrastructure, everything from your switches and storage um, through the things that most people do around sort of host level management. Um, but increasingly, uh, there's tools around the sort of container space and the sort of orchestrator space as well. So, um, one of the, the sort of how this came about really um, was I've been doing for a little while a bunch of integration uh, between Puppet and Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes provides that really strong API, that really strong set of primitives, the replication controllers, services, pods, etc. But actually, we're sort of getting up and running with Kubernetes is, is at the moment, Kubernetes is still a relatively low level component. And, and one of the things I found as I was doing that integration was how easy it was to get up and running with OpenShift. Um, so that ended up with OpenShift being nearly the, the environment I was using to, to demonstrate and to uh, sort of develop against for the, Kubernetes, for the Puppet integration. So it's nice to like then come from full circle and demonstrate a bunch of that back to um, yourselves. So uh, for those that want to uh, have a look at this afterwards, a um, uh, good starting point is the actual the, the module. So uh, Puppet uh, is mainly extended by writing modules. So none of this integration is sort of requiring changes to Puppet or requiring sort of new versions. Uh, there is just a module on the forge. Um, it's under my namespace at the moment, so Gareth R slash Kubernetes. Um, and what that provides is the ability to describe Kubernetes in Puppet code. Um, by which I mean, this isn't about uh, installing Kubernetes. And ultimately, if you're using OpenShift, you already have Kubernetes. It's already there and exposed and set up and managed. Um, so it's not about installing and configuring that. Um, though we might look at doing so with OpenShift in the future. Um, it's about what you then do with Kubernetes. It's about, in, in this example, a sort of trivial pod, but it's also about all of those primitives in the API, the replication controllers, services, deployment uh, managers, etc. cetera. Um, for those that are familiar with Kubernetes already, uh, what you'll notice about the code example that's on your screen is that it follows the same format in Puppet, it's we, it's just a different DSL. Um, so if you're already familiar with uh, the Kubernetes structure, the Kubernetes API, you're probably already familiar with how you would write that in Puppet. And that was an explicit design decision. Um, in fact, there are uh, some tools provided as part of the module, uh, which I'll demonstrate later, that can take a Kubernetes uh, YAML file and actually just take that and generate the, and give you the puppet code. Um, in fact, as well, the uh, the actual module itself 
nearly all of the code for the module is auto generated from the Swagger specification. So uh, keeping the module up to date is literally just a matter of regenerating it based on the updated Swagger specification. Um, Kubernetes has some really nice features and sort of API driven bits and pieces that make that sort of integration pretty seamless. Um, so far though, you might be thinking, well, I could describe it in one broadly speaking data format, YAML, um, or I could describe it in the format that I'm showing. There's not really much value there. And I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, really the advantage comes because Puppet is a programming language. Um, yes, it, it can be treated as sort of quite key value pair esque data, but ultimately you can create your own abstractions. So um, for those that are familiar with Puppet, we have defined types and classes. Um, and you can build those, and this is an example of a defined type. Uh, this isn't part of the module, this is just something I put together um, uh, while doing some work around the Kubernetes guestbook example. So one of the things you find with the sort of just taking a purely data sort of centric approach to Kubernetes configuration and like handwriting the YAML files, which are really the wire format for the API, you end up with a lot of repetition because it's the wire format for the API. Um, but with Puppet, you can actually abstract end users away from that and provide higher level interfaces. So one of the things that I'm often seeing is that you often end up with a, a pair, a controller and a service. And um, often like they go hand in hand. Um, the API should treat them as individual things. However, the user interface to that does not necessarily need to do so. And in public, you can just create your own user interface, build your own abstractions, just using the built-in uh, standard Puppet tools. Um, so that's a simple example, and I'll and I'll show uh, some examples of that as well later on. Um, for those that want to sort of like again pick through some of the details, see some of the code, um, uh, there's a blog post up on the Puppet blog uh, from uh, like a month or so, month or so ago, um, all about a bunch of the examples I'm going to show and sort of going from like setting up a, uh, an OpenShift cluster locally um, using the provided backup machines to trying out the Puppet code and being, getting the configuration in the middle done. Um, and there's more blog posts as well, both on the Puppet blog, but also on the Kubernetes blog about the sort of, like the advantages of higher level interfaces to Kubernetes. Um, ultimately, you can use many different interfaces at the same time for different purposes. Um, Puppet's sort of declarative nature means that it's very good for that sort of like high level, like change control managed sort of change. Um, whereas there's something like the user, the more the sort of graphical user interface in the uh, Kubernetes console is fantastic for sort of like the like seeing the state, knowing what's going on at any given moment. Um, I'm also going to add a quick bonus example because I think it's probably relevant to folks here. Um, uh, I've recently done a little bit of work around uh, using Puppet with Atomic um, and with Atomic often being used under the hood of uh, OpenShift. I thought that would be hopefully interesting to the same audience as well. Um, and all of that's powered by uh, a set of um, uh, uh, open source uh, images that we've pushed to Hub. So I'll talk about that a little bit as well. So hopefully that's a reasonable example, um, sort of like introduction rather. Um, and people are still here, and I'll uh, hopefully be able to click through to the, uh, my console and show some demos. Yeah, we're all still here. Um, right, so the screen will be a bit small, but I'll make it bigger. That looks perfect, yeah. Uh, does that look good? Excellent. That looks really good. I'll just grab some water. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, set up an OpenShift uh, cluster. I've already got one up and running. So um, I'll let the screen refresh sort of a little bit. Um, sometimes it takes a little while. Um, so I've already got a, it's just a single node uh, uh, OpenShift cluster, um, sort of brand new one one three. Um, so there's anything running so far? Um, We've just got Kubernetes running. There's nothing else there. It's totally fresh cluster. Um, I've also, uh, so I've done the configuration. I've, I've put the uh, 
the puppet module simply uses the, the standard um, Kube uh, configs. So you just need to put them into the relevant place for Puppet to discover them, and then everything just works. Um, again, like the blog posts cover setting things up, so I won't go into that in too much detail. Um, but the module ships with a number of different examples, and the one I'm going to have a look at today uh, is, is setting up a, a, a small Redis cluster. So, I'm going to open up a public config file. Um, so, here where uh, you can see the public module has types for um, basically all the the primitives in Kubernetes. So we've got a Kubernetes underscore replication underscore controller type. Um, and here we're setting up a master. We're providing the metadata. Um, we're pro providing the spec. And again, this is a very low level part. So you can see here there's a lot of duplication in the same way as the YAML file. I'll come on to how Puppet can be used to solve that repetition problem uh, shortly. But this is demonstration. This is the low, lowest level part. So if I go down, you'll probably see a service. You'll see another replication controller for the sort of uh, masters and slaves. So we're setting up a, a proper uh, sort of master and slave based Kubernetes cluster. And so far, as I said that this will follow exactly the same format as the YAML file. If we had a YAML file that described this, we could actually uh, run the uh, generate command, and that would give us the public code. Um, for the purposes of this, I'm going to run uh, Puppet apply. Um, so Puppet is often run with sort of an agent and a master. Um, so the Puppet server uh, you can connect to and things call home. I'm just using local Puppet apply here to demonstrate the types and provi the providers provided with the Kubernetes module. Um, but this would totally work with uh, having an, an agent as well. Um, I'm also going to run it with test just so we get a bit more output. So what's happening under the hood is that the Puppet module simply uh, reads the Puppet code, um, converts that into the relevant API calls to Kubernetes on top of OpenShift, and OpenShift does the rest. So if we flick through the sort of outputs, you can see uh, it's checking if a few things are existing. It's creating the things that aren't. So it uh, creates uh, there. We've been seeing a couple of replication controls, a couple of services. So in theory, um, we should be able to see them now up and running in OpenShift. So uh, also you get services. Uh, we can see Redis master, Redis slave. Um, we should see a number of pods starting to launch or already running. Um, so, so far, this is very similar to how you might use kubectl um, to do exactly the same sort of thing with kubectl apply. But one of the things I can do here is uh, use Puppet's idempotent nature. So we can we can keep running the same commands. We can still run the same uh, code through Puppet. And ultimately, Puppet doesn't try and recreate things. It doesn't create new things. It just simply says, oh, those things already exist. Um, and so you can have that constant uh, in a sort of FO production setup, that, like that running constantly, allowing you to change the code if you want to change the system. But also running and having that constant tick, that constant feedback, that your system is is still configured exactly how you want it. Um, that has the advantage that if people do have like sort of individual command line access and and start doing things where maybe someone for for whatever reason logs in and changes something unbeknownst to the rest of the team, actually put people would put that back and tell you about it. So. If I were to, for example, uh, delete a service, let's delete the. So the service is gone, and if I run up it again, um, instead of finding it, it should find that it's missing, and it should recreate it. Hopefully, there we go. So we see a notice there that the ready the ready slave service was uh, created, and it should all be back. So again, like it's the same pattern of usage as with Puppet on a host with packages or users or files. Um, and again, like the, in a production setup, you'd, you'd have all the reporting and all the data going back into something like PuppetDB or another tool. So there are some advantages there to the sort of just using the standard YAML files. Um, 
but there's still a lot of syntax. Um, let's see what we can do about that. So, alongside just the single YAML file, um, I'll work backwards here as an example. Um, I also have a defined type just called Redis cluster, and it takes a standard title, um, in this case first, and it takes a size. Uh, I'll show how this is implemented in a second. I'll give it a quick run first. So here I'm, I'm running the folder, which then runs a bunch of the files in there. Um, and we can see that it actually very similar output to the previous one, it created uh, it created uh, two services, two replication controllers. So we should be able to see those. Um, and you can see the, the, the ones that are perfect with first. Um, so that setup took um, a, that size of two. And if you look here, we have a single master and uh, two slaves. Let's play around with that a bit. So let's bump the size to five. Exit. Um, and rerun our puppet code. And again, some of those definitions don't need to change, but one of them do, does, and we, we see the change notice uh, appearing there. Um, the output is a little bit verbose, it ca contains everything. Uh, um, it would be nice to sort of format that better for users for in a CLI here, and um, that's definitely something I'm interested in doing. Um, but the change results are there, and if you had a, a report on the other side, you'd have something to pass that out anyway. So what we should see now is, well, we updated uh, the replication controller. The replication controller then said, well, I'm running two replicas, apparently, and I now should have five, and the pods have all launched. Um, and we could go the other way. But what's maybe even more interesting is, well, I've created this high-level primitive um, for, for called Redis cluster. And well, now I can reuse it. So rather than something having to know all of the implementation details, now we know what a Redis cluster is. We can create lots of them. We have, we've, we've got a high level interface just by using Puppet as a programming language. And that, that's the real key to sort of the advantage here um, on top of just using data. So you can see here that there's now a second master starting to come up, a few slaves. And you could imagine changing those numbers and adding more and like doing that at a very high level rather than, and we'll look at the implementation here, um, so under the hood, Redis cluster is simply a defined type in Puppet. Um, it takes an argument of a size, but it has a default of two. So you wouldn't even have to provide a size. You could just say like, give me a Redis cluster and it's called this. Um, for those that haven't seen, Puppet 4 has uh, full typing hints. So even here, I'm, I'm saying that this has to be an integer. If you pass a string or an array, Puppet will give you a, a nice error. So that's, uh, again, like we can create these high level interfaces with fully typed parameters, um, which really helps sort of people avoid errors. Uh, we've got a controller service pair. I, I mentioned this is another abstraction. So we've got a few abstractions going on here, but you can keep digging in. And it's only at the bottom layer, it's only here where you, you see like the actual, the, the low level Kubernetes types being used. And I mentioned before about that sort of, the Kubernetes wire format is quite repetitive. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't have to be because we, we have the ability to use variables. So yes, we're passing uh, the labels into the metadata and into the spec so everything's wired up correctly. But we're not having, like, if I want to change the value of app or the value of role, well, I change it at the variable level and that's going to propagate through like in the number of places it's used, including in multiple different resources in the Kubernetes service and Kubernetes uh, replication controller in this case. Um, so I'm using replication controllers and services as good high level examples, but the module supports uh, pretty much all of the, uh, like the different resources in Kubernetes, as I mentioned, because actually the code is all generated from uh, 
the spec. So that's really a sort of a, a good introduction, hopefully, to the Kubernetes module. Um, I say, yeah, you could create uh, config sets, you could create the rest of it. We could go on and make actually an entire setup and, and other high level types that are specific to like sort of our business problems. Um, uh, and we could demonstrate it integrating with all the sort of the rest of the puppet tools. Um, but I'll leave that as a bit of an exercise uh, for people who are interested in uh, following up. So I think, I think, did you uh, have another, yeah. another demo that you want to do there? Yeah, I've got one quick of the demo as well. Okay, go for it. And, and then we'll get to it. So, I mentioned briefly that we've just shipped a number of uh, uh, images to the to the hub um, containing Puppet software. So these are uh, containers with Puppet Server, um, so the open source Puppet Server, um, Puppet DB, a number of the sort of uh, the uh, dashboards from the community and the Puppet and a Factor uh, image. One of the advantages of doing that is that uh, we can run on top of something like Atomic, where the unit of software isn't an RPM, the unit of software is a container. So suddenly, we, by shipping those, we have pretty good atomic support. So I'll just demonstrate that really quickly. Um, I'm uh, not running on an atomic host, but I have a uh, Vagrant running. I have a virtual machine running atomic. Um, and that hopefully should be up and running. Uh, the, the code for this is actually available in the examples repository for the Puppet in Docker project. So if you want to try this out yourself, you can just sort of uh, go along and type Vagrant up. But I've already got that up and running for this sort of quick demo. Uh, I've also set up a, I'll briefly show the Vagrant file. Um, I'm using the, uh, the CentOS atomic host box. Um, I've got a bit more memory, so it's a bit more snappy. Um, and I'm, when, when the machine comes up, there's a provisioner that will pull down the relevant images I'm using in this example and uh, run a, basically run a puppet server inside a container on an atomic host. So you could run an entire puppet infrastructure if you wanted to. Um, I've set up a couple of provisioners for running Factor and running Puppet, and I'll show those running. So this is just a shortcut to running things over SSA. So how we're doing is, is that the container mounts the volumes from the atomic host and connects to the host network. So the output here isn't of like the container context, it's of the outlying um, atomic host. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can see a bunch of things around sort of what is demo for an atomic host. We can see things from the host, not from uh, here we go, the the OS. You can see what it's saying this is a Red Hat machine, so CentOS machine. And we'll be adding prop full support to factor um, for detecting that it's actually an atomic machine. And then you could do all sorts of other nice things. Um, and you can run because Factor can now just detect things about the atomic host. Well, Puppet can be used to manage things on that underlying host. Um, that might include starting other containers, or it might include uh, putting some files onto the underlying host, um, or users, or firewalls, or anything you would normally use Puppet for. Um, you can now do that on Atomic. So again, the example here is in it's on a public GitHub repository uh, in the Puppet in Docker examples repository under the Puppet Labs name for um, And with that, uh, they're, they're my demos. Hopefully, they were interesting, and I'm happy to take some questions. That's great. Can you pop over to that GitHub repo that you were just talking about and just throw that up on the screen so that we end on that and, that, and people yes. know where, where to find all these examples? It's pretty mind boggling all the ways that you can schedule stuff on. Um, Kubernetes and OpenShift and Atomic and and um, I've always had a great love for for Puppet, so um, I'm looking looking forward to, to getting to use it some more again. And yeah, the the examples repo um, uh, with the Puppet and Docker work and the Atomic uh, example in, in particular is uh, on the screen. Perfect, perfect. All right. Well, I'm opening up the questions. We've got a couple of basic, you know, really basic ones, which I've tried to answer in the chat um, about Kubernetes and, and other things. And, you know, as always, when you're talking OpenShift, someone always brings up Ansible. 
But um, they, there are so many tools out there right now um, that different enterprises are using, um, whether they're using Anthem or Steph or Puppet, really just want to make sure that, um, that whatever the tool of choice is, is available for people to use. And, and I think there's Puppet is, is, is one of the wildly popular offering so i'm really appreciative of, of getting the chance and, ha and having you create this module and um, do this um, for all of the public users out there in um, openshift land it's, it's pretty pretty key hi uh okay. so this is rob great i have another question um i do i handle isvs uh, that we are having partner with ourselves and we're directing a lot of them now to openshift as a means of integration Mm -hmm. with our other products that say, well, we'll get them into OpenShift, we'll put Fuse in OpenShift, we'll put other things in OpenShift. That's a great place to uh, to integrate. What can we do with Puppet to simplify the um, of people to that, you know, and to Kubernetes? Because often they, they, they come in, they don't know anything about OpenShift. They have typically gone into to, you know, up, gone into the uh, the Google or the Microsoft Cloud or Amazon Cloud, and what can we do to this? What, what can Puppet with uh, Kubernetes do to make this as painless a process as possible? Because I, my concern is we we often throw up something like, well, to get to our unfamiliar technology, you have to learn th two or three other technologies to get there. Yeah. So you know, these guys probably don't know Puppet. They no Kubernetes, they don't know OpenShift, um, and they're just sort of going like, "Look, for the love of God, we just want to we just want to get this thing, you know, coordinated with with one of our other products." Uh, what can we do to sort of simplify that? So this, this so that Kubernetes. My my ask is, how can we make Puppet, Kubernetes, and OpenShift practically invisible to them? That's, that, a, that's a good good question. I don't really want to make Puppet invisible to them. Um, I think what it is is that a lot of people already have the Puppet expertise in-house. They're already using it to do their CI, CD workflows. They're already using it to script all kinds of things because it's it's wonderful. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is keep them in a familiar world um, and then allow them to use the tools they know to move forward into a cloud native OpenShift Kubernetes universe. Uh, well, I, I was I'd, wondering, like, I'd, I'd sort of echo like the same thing. That I, I think Puppet's probably not going to be the sort of the de facto sort of default entry point to people coming in, like as you described. Um, but actually, Puppet's in widespread use across lots of organizations. So there's a lot of prior art around the, the Puppet language. And what we're finding is that Puppet as a universal tool in particular in organizations where they have that sort of they're running a bunch of AIX stuff, they're running a lot of rel stuff, they're running maybe even should we say some windows bits and pieces, and they're now looking towards running uh OpenShift and Puppet as a universal tool and language across that sort of diverse infrastructure is the sort of sweet spot. But not everyone will have that sort of okay. diversity and there are sort of the, there are close there are sort of more na native Kubernetes tools and native OpenShift tools. I think all of them can will coexist, mainly around the strength of the Kubernetes API. Yeah. yeah. Let me. Well, here's I guess here's the here would be the, the partner ask, and I know we can't achieve it, but how can we get as close to it as possible? And that's. Um, uh, what they would like is they go to a website, they upload their app, hit submit, and magic, it's on OpenShift. As an available container, you know, kind of like one of the old gears where other people can use it now, and it can be used and spun up and, and integrated with everything else. I mean, that's everybody's ask is, you know, make, make me an easy button. Yeah, How so close can we get to an easy button? We're pretty close to that easy button right now. Um, actually, that was the image that uh, that big easy button that is one of the, 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 there's two prongs to this conversation. One is we can make it 
we, can, we make OpenShift the easy button for enterprise Kubernetes deployments. So if you want to deploy OpenShift and you're in a customer situation or an end user, some, some operations house, um, and they want to deploy Kubernetes and OpenShift in, with a real simple set of scripts, and sorry, they're all Ansible, Garetha. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's one, one path in. And the other path in it, um, that, Rob, that I'd ask you to take a look at now um, is the um, OpenShift Online using um, OpenShift 3, using the new version of OpenShift is now up and available for the developer preview. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing okay. um, is, is a little bit based on um, your memories of OpenShift 2 with our cartridges and gears and um, our sort of marketplace and quick starts and all of that so that you could really get in quickly and reuse and save um, the quick start so that you can get an app up and running and anybody who, who had access to that quick start could start it really quickly. And the same user experience um, from the web console with the new release of OpenShift um, is, is there. Um, it's a little more complicated because there's a few more things that you have to put in place in order to make um, uh, containerize what we call an application. Know, be aware of all the other containers in its service. Um, so, but the the user experience right, I, and, and I think we, like we're departing in middleware where these are not just Java. You know, these are not just the ear and war applications that we tradition to. We're recruiting things like machine learning companies, big data analytics, blockchain, mm -hmm. others. Often it's not, and one of the reasons we're, uh, I'm interested in it because, and, and I know it's, it's anathema to our engineers, so it's not, these aren't even written in Java frequently. And so it's how do we bridge that gap? As a result, I, I, so I, I, I'd actually ask you to partners we have. Take, take a look at the, um, the new well, online experience and also take a look at um, okay. under OpenShift. Can you send me a link for that? Yeah, I will, and uh, a link, and take a look at the source to image set of tools, um, because once okay. uh, once people start creating their images um, and they push them to private registries, which are often hosted on OpenShift as well, um, then it, that's how you get your um, reusable images um, that people can, other people from within that company or organization that have access to that registry can use and deploy from the OpenShift console. So that's that, that I think is the methodology, and and I know we've gotten off track, Gareth, because that's oh, no always doing these yeah. sessions. But um, we're, we're nearly back to my talk at DockerCon around just and the the sort of diversity, but also like fairly early stage of a lot of the container build tools. Um, but like, and as we were talking there, it was like the next six six twelve months is going to see like a better that of tooling, like improvements to what's there, and probably, sorry, hope, well, hopefully some. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get you off your. No, I didn't mean to get you off topic, but for us, this is a big one because we're we're steering them this way, and we're looking for anything that makes their life easier to yep. get there, and and it's you know so that we don't have to say, so that, okay, you guys are absolute experts in R, and you know every statistical um, app ever ever built. But we need, you know, uh, but, you know, here's how you get into da 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 yeah. uh, so and Kubernetes. Yeah, so I, I, as, as you probably may or may not know, I'm a Python person. Um, and uh, okay. we have a couple of good write-ups on the blog. Um, I think Graham Dumpleton did them um, on doing basically what, not for R, but for Python, um, creating custom um, source to image um, toolings for Python to get all the bits that we need. And and you'll see a directory also in the OpenShift um, world, and I'm trying to think of it in the repo where it is exactly, but I'll, I'll, I'll dig it up and I'll, I'll post it with this um, recording. But um, there is, with source to image, you're building the tooling, um, or someone is building the tooling, whether it's one of the Python folks and the evangelist crew or one of the engineers, but you can build reusable tooling to build out as many images you, as you want for the R community, for example. And so you're starting to get the baseline um, tool chain for build services and continuous integration and deployment of images 
um, the centered around tools like S2I and some of the other ones that Gareth mentioned. Um, it is Docker Convent. So the high level tools for doing all this um, and pushing them to private registries, which you can then expose to your organizational wise and set the, the user access to them. So there is a whole um, workflow and that's probably a topic for yet another briefing um, sometime soon. So um, uh, it's a good question. And um, I think the documentation is probably lacking more than the tooling at this point. Um, so we'll have to work on that, I think a bit more. But good question. There's a couple other folks on the call, um, the briefing right now. If there's any other questions, um, you can toss them in chat. If not, um, this is about the normal length that we do our, our briefings for. So it's pretty good and um, great content. I really love the Atomic demo. So I think we're gonna have to push a little bit more um, content around that as well. So I think that's um, a great, great use of Atomic and Puppet together. So thanks, Garrett. Yep, uh, no, thank you. All right. Yeah, and, thanks for having me. All right, and there will not be a briefing next week because it's Red Hat Summit week. So we'll be giving ourselves a break and which is not really a break, but, um, and then coming on back on in the following week. So thanks again and um, everyone uh, have a great week and hopefully we'll see you all at Red Hat Summit. <laughs>